Well, we've got a brand new sermon series we're beginning today, one that's very fitting for the season, I believe. Don't let this scare you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, but this time of year, we're confronted with death uh, in, a, in a way that we're not confronted with death the rest of the year. Uh, for example, take your neighbor's yards or maybe even your own yard. Uh, take the, the aisles at Walmart or the Halloween Super Express, whatever stores that pop up. Uh, you see some pretty interesting things. Uh, in my own neighborhood, I've seen uh, inflatable pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns, even uh, Darth Vader holding a jack-o'-lantern. I mean, really interesting stuff. Uh, but then you look beyond that and you begin to see plastic tombstones in people's yards. You got a picture. That's not my neighbor's yard. I just found that on Google. But, but there are some yards. That's a real yard out there, not just to sell decorations. There's skeletons in my neighborhood hanging from trees. And uh, one of my favorites is one of my neighbor's if you're here, I love it, by the way, but it's a zombie that's coming out of the living room window with a red light behind it. What? Now, if he had put that up in February when you're supposed to have hearts on your door, people would move out around him. They, the property value would probably go down because why does he have a zombie coming out of his, you know, of his window in February? We just don't talk about death or display signs of death in the same way the rest of the year that we do in October. And I wonder uh, why somebody, by the way, my favorite decoration would buy a zombie gnome to put in their yard. I'm going to see if it's still there in December when the, the Christmas trees come out. Why do we do that in October without even really thinking about it? I mean, why do we splatter sugar water or whatever on our faces to look like blood? If you walked into the store to buy a Christmas tree in December with fake blood on your face, people would be calling the police, right? So there's something about October that makes us do this stuff without question. But here's the interesting thing. We tend to keep death at arm's length the rest of the year, really even in October. I mean, we have this plastic size kind of this sense of control over it, but the rest of the year, I mean, you don't have a plastic gravestone in your front yard. You don't have skulls decorating your house, right? If you do, it's kind of scary, right? And so, so it's time to have a conversation about death in the church. And that's actually not something that's odd. Uh, I know you're thinking, well, gosh, I came, you know, for an uplifting sermon, uh, but spoiler alert, uh, our, all of our lives are going to end in death. Sorry, I ruined the ending for you. Uh, but, but we're all going to die, and so we need to learn and prepare to die well. But as we're going to learn today, dying well is really more about living well. And so that's why the juxtaposition here in this title, Death, A Guide to Living Well, we're going to be talking over the next five weeks about, about living well. But there is an interesting conversation to be had, because in the Middle Ages, the church realized its responsibility about the 15th century or so, to help people learn to die well. And there was something developed out of uh, the Christian tradition called the Ars Moriendi, which means the art of dying. And it has guided Christian conversations about death and dying since the Middle Ages. Through the Enlightenment and through uh, the, the Industrial Age here in America, uh, the church saw it as its role to not only teach people to live well, but to die well too. That there was an art, there's a procedure, there are questions that you ask the dying in order to prepare to be in the presence of Jesus. Well, churches still are the places where people come for funerals. But since I've been here for almost two years now, I've done one funeral for somebody who even attended or was a member of the church, and I've done about six for folks who drove by the church but didn't have a church home and wanted a pastor. All right? So there's still this sense that, that when somebody dies, the church should be a part of it somehow, and, but yet I'm finding that we don't always have the resources to draw from to deal with the grief and all the, the things that have to happen around a death. And so on one end, you've got the church with this deep tradition and this deep history of, of dealing with death. And that's actually grounded in the scriptures. And I've got, I want to share the scripture with you today from 1 Corinthians. This is kind of where this whole idea is grounded. Paul writes this, when the perishable body has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, the saying that has been written in the Old Testament will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? But thanks, oh, the sting of uh, death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Ars Moriendi and the, the tradition of the church would say that death is to be welcomed like a friend. Would you ever welcome death like a friend? I mean, that, that sounds counter to our culture, but... But it says that we should prepare to die by living in such a way where we truly believe God's promises. That death is not an end, but it's the, the beginning of, 
of something new and something different. It's the continuation of life from life on earth to life in eternity. Beautiful thing. Well, in the mid-20th century, death became more medicalized. As the medical profession began to rise in its uh, understanding of, of science and technology and new treatments were, were being hailed, now, the medical community kind of transferred the responsibility and the burden of death from the individual and the family and the church uh, into the hospital setting. And now decisions about life and death are largely in the hands of, of doctors and, and hospital staff and, and people who are guiding us through those things. And that also has a theological grounding in the scriptures. And I want to share this. In the same chapter where we read the, the first passage from, Paul writes, writes this. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So on one hand, from the Middle Ages, you've got the church saying that death should be welcomed like a friend because of the victory that's been won through Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. But on this other side, you've got the medical uh, community that's saying death is an enemy to be defeated. And so we're going to do that through science and technology. We're going to prolong life, which is all a great thing and I think is God-honoring because God is on the side of life. But do you see that there's a conversation to be had here in the middle, a tension that needs to be navigated? This became very timely because there's a new and renewed conversation in the national media about uh, control over when and how we die. And this actually was brought to the national stage through Brittany Maynard last year. Do you remember this story? Now, this was a young 25-year-old lady, a 29-year-old lady who was diagnosed with a brain tumor and was given five to ten years to live, and then April, her situation changed, and she was given six months. And so she made the decision, after hearing about kind of the suffering and everything that was involved with her, her, uh, her medical condition, she left her home in California, moved with her new husband to Oregon, where she could have control over when and how she passed away. And she made the choice uh, to pass away on November 1st of last year, and she did. Uh, and that sparked a whole national conversation about death and dying well. But at the same time, there was a, a young lady named Kara Tippetts who had also been diagnosed with a terminal disease. And Kara had a whole different view of dying. Uh, she saw dying as being a part of our life. She saw dying as being a stage of life and learning that we must all go through before we enter eternity. That there's this, this sense of learning that has to take place before we, we can understand and live into everlasting life. And Kara Tippetts wrote an open letter to Brittany Maynard, and I wanted to share some of her words because they came out of a very deep struggle. By the way, Kara was 36 uh, when she began her journey. Here are some of the things that she said, and I hope they speak to you like they spoke to me. She, first, she was talking about suffering. She said, suffering is not the absence of goodness. It is not the absence of beauty. But perhaps it can be the place where true beauty can be known. Knowing Jesus, knowing that he understands my hard goodbye, and that he walks with me in my dying, because in, in his dying, he protected my living, my living beyond this place. See, she had a sense that God was with her, not against her, not causing what she was going through, but was that companion that was walking with her. And then she says to Brittany, Brittany, you've been told a terrible lie, a horrible lie that your dying will not be beautiful. She learned, later on went to say, that as she was preparing her own children for her death, that there was something beautiful to be passed on as they shared those last moments of her life with her children, something that would define their living for the rest of their lives. There's this recognition in the church that, that suffering produces something that brings salvation, something of the experience of God, something of hope that's beyond being able to be named. And that's where I want to go today. And my thesis that we're going to explore is that dying well really means living well. It's living every day as if we are preparing to die. I know, seems morbid, right? Here, I, mean, I should have worn a Grim Reaper costume, but, but I'm not because this is actually joyful, and I hope that this is a conversation that, that you want to have too. I think it's important for the church to reclaim our place. So, so let's do it. Uh, our passage today that we're going to look at primarily is Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11 and 14 through 18. So I invite you, if you have your Bible, to follow along. Uh, it'll also be up here on the screen. Listen now to a word from our Lord. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, 
should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes perfect people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to make, be made like them in every way, in order that he might become a merciful high priest in service of God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. There's so much of the Christian faith that hinges and is to be found in these passages. And this could be, uh, we could spend the rest of the year just doing these few passages from Hebrews. But I want to summarize it pretty quickly to get to where we're going in this. God loved us so much that he came. He came to fulfill humanity in the way that he created it to be. He came to restore the image of God in every single one of us. He did that by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to live in the flesh to deal with temptation like we do, but to overcome it. Jesus is the only human being in history that's led a perfect and sinless life. Jesus cultivated a relationship with God in life and shared that relationship with other people by, by spending time with and ministering with those that the rest of uh, those who were in power didn't want to associate with. I mean, Jesus was the example. Uh, he prayed to his Father every morning. Uh, he taught. He learned the Scriptures. He did what the Spirit led him to do. Jesus lived a perfect life, and that prepared him to die the death that he did. Because he lived a sinless life, Jesus was able to defeat evil and death once and for all. And you'll recall in the Scriptures that, that death exists because of sin, because of the fall. That was the consequence of us choosing our way rather than God's way. And so Jesus' death was unjust. Jesus didn't deserve the penalty of death because he didn't sin. And so by submitting to death, Jesus did the one thing for us that we could never do ourselves. He defeated the devil. He defeated sin. He defeated evil once and for all so that he could make a way for us to enter everlasting life. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying here. Jesus in every way lived like we live. He was tempted but overcame. And he too knows what it is to suffer in life and in death. Jesus identifies with us in every way because he went through it before us. He paved the way. He's the, the author of salvation, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, as the author of Hebrews says. And so he is the high priest that understands, who intercedes for us, who makes a way for us to have courage in the face of death. Did you hear? Did you hear what the author of Hebrews said that Jesus did? He defeated the, the slavery that we feel to the fear of death. Did you catch that? That we are slaves to the fear of death. And what Jesus did for us, not only in dying, but rising again, frees us from the fear of death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Right? Jesus has defeated sin and death so that we can be in the presence of God forever. That's what this, this passage is saying. And I think the underlying message for us is to die well means to live well. Jesus could die well because of the life that he lived. And that's what we're going to study today. What I want to do in the time that remains is talk about the five temptations that the Ars Moriendi and that great tradition that's been here for hundreds of years lifts up uh, that we face in the time of death. And then I want to teach you some virtues, some virtues that we can draw upon to live well that guide us in life as well as preparing to enter eternal life. And so I hope this will be useful to you. It's, it's really helped me as I've, I've learned this week. First, let's talk a little bit about suffering. Suffering means to bear under literally means to bear under. So suffering is something that we submit to. It's something that we have no control over. And so sometimes I think that for us, the physical pain is less of an issue than the loss of control. Think about that. Sometimes with suffering, physical pain is not as big of a thing for us as the loss of control over our own lives and over our own situation. And hence the, the difficult decisions about about death and dying well. You know, do we choose or does God choose for us? The Brittany Maynard or the Kara Tippetts? 
That's the, the key here. And so here's the temptations to see life all the way through to the point God calls you home. The first in the Ars Moriendi is the temptation to lose faith. The temptation to lose faith. At the time of our deaths, it's natural, it seems, to want to blame God for the situation that we find ourselves in. And when we do that, we almost alienate ourselves from the one who is there beside us, weeping with us and journeying with us, the one who is waiting to receive us when he calls us home. And so there's this, this place where, where if we lose faith, all of a sudden we lose the resources that we need to, to take the journey that we're taking. And so we need to, to cultivate trust in God throughout our lives in order to keep from losing faith in the face of death. To look backwards and say, God has been with me through every hardship that I've ever faced, and God is not going to leave me now. Okay, so we have to, to work through the, the temptation to lose faith. The second temptation that the Ars Moriendi lifts up is the temptation to despair. Because death doesn't just threaten our earthly existence, it, it threatens the, the relationships that we have and it brings the shattering of the hopes that we held. That's one of the hardest things to deal with in death is I had plans to do this and I'm not going to be able to do that anymore and coming to terms with your own mortality. Uh, despair is defeated by hope. Because we have hope in the one who has defeated sin and death once and for all. We have hope in resurrection. And so we have to cultivate that hope throughout life in order to deal with the sense of despair in dying. The third temptation is impatience. Uh, I've, I've been with people who have just grown tired through the constant care of doctors and family and medical personnel. They're just tired and they're, they're done. So to combat impatience, we have to cultivate patience, waiting on God, knowing that God is with us, listening in prayer, looking for purpose. Uh, that's one of the temptations that we experience. The fourth is self-reliance. You know, very often when we're the one in the hospital bed or the bed at home, we're kind of embarrassed about the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, we don't want to have to rely on other people to care for us, or we don't want to be a burden on the people who are caring. And so sometimes the temptation is to push people out of the way and just to deal with it on our own. But in those moments, we need to cultivate the sense of, of being helped so that we can surround ourselves with the very people who need to be a part of our last days. And finally, the final temptation is the sense of clinging to life. Uh, the Ars Moriendi would almost call it idolatry in, in a way that we cling to the idea of living on earth more than living life in Christ and following God into eternity when God calls. And so part of dying well is overcoming uh, the sense of clinging to our earthly lives and trusting God beyond. So here's where we're going to end. How do we live well? How do we prepare for those moments where we're making those decisions? I think we have to follow the life and death of Jesus so that living like Jesus, we can prepare to die as Jesus died, confident of what lies ahead. To do this, I want to look at Jesus' seven final words on the cross because they didn't just talk about how Jesus died, but to me they embodied the life that he lived. And we're going to go through these rather quickly, but I hope this will be a source of reflection for you as you're processing today and maybe even dealing with a difficult situation in your own life. Uh, so Jesus' first final word on the cross uh, was from Luke 23, 34. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgiveness is essential for dying well, isn't it? You want to release the control of the hurt that others have caused in your life so that you can die a peaceful death. But you also want to ask for forgiveness for the ways that you've wronged other people. That's essential for dying well, but you know what? It's also essential for living well, too. Think of the anxiety that you would release if you were able to forgive people when you feel wronged by them. And it's hard to do. Uh, I know just from my pastoral ministry, folks cling to the, the burden of, of pain and hurt for way longer than they need to. And sometimes it takes a while to work through things, but it's worth the journey. That's what the church family is for. That's what your small groups are for. That's what I'm here for, to help you work through what you have to get through in order to release the hurt that somebody else is still holding over you because you can't forgive. Forgiveness is essential for living and dying well. Jesus' second word on the cross was this from Luke 23. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Even in his last moments, 
Jesus offered salvation to the one who was willing to place his faith in him, the thief that died next to him on the cross. Today you will be saved. Today, because of your faith, you will be with me in paradise. Today, today. This is important for us as well. Because in the moments of our our dying, there may be people that we need to pass the faith along to. People that need to hear those words of salvation because they have to continue living life. And they're learning something of living through our dying. And so offering those words of salvation is essential. But that's not just something to do on your deathbed. It's something that you cultivate throughout your lives as well. God has given you family relationships co-working relationships, relationships with your neighbors and people at the grocery store and on your kids' soccer teams and all of that. We've got to cultivate the ability to offer healing words and saving words, the very words of Christ to people so that they too can learn to live well. This is a part of our Christian lives and is foundational for the ministry that Christ has called us all to. The third cry of Jesus from the cross was a word of love toward his mother. Look at these words. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Dying well means caring for and nurturing the relationships of those in your care, those who are closest to you, making plans so that they can be taken care of beyond your life. But in living well, it means taking care of these relationships each and every day. Not letting anger or mistrust or anything divide you from those that are closest to you. Forgiving and asking for forgiveness, that comes up time and time again, when you need to, so that you can nurture those relationships from the people that God has placed in your care with your parents, with your children, with your grandchildren, aunts and uncles, cousins, whatever, friends. Because when you don't do this through life, you end up dying alone. You need those folks with you, and they need you, even in a time of death. So it's so important to take care of the primary relationships in your life. And we do this in many ways, through wills and through, through uh, savings plans and, and insurance and all of those things. I mean, there are, there are those practical steps that you need to take, but you've also got to do the deep spiritual work on an ongoing basis as well. And Jesus' death reminds us of that. The fourth cry is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is quoting Psalm 22. He's lamenting. He's lamenting the loss of his human life. Here he's he's talking about bearing the weight of our sin and the agony that he went through in doing that. But for us, it, it leaves room for lament in our own lives. If we're with somebody who's dying, they're letting go. We too, in our time of death, are letting go. We lament the loss of this life on earth. We're processing the things that we do. Sometimes the church is told a bold faced lie. They have said that that to lament is to not trust in God. I want to say that is not true at all. To me, lament is a deep and abiding trust in the God who's not far off causing what what you're going through, but is the one that's walking through it with you. The one who's going to receive you on the other side of eternity. When you can lament what what you are grieving in that moment, you open yourself up to receive God's presence in those darkest and most difficult moments of your life. Fifth, Jesus says, I am thirsty. This shows that Jesus was present, completely present in all of his humanity until his last breath. It says that the body is important, that we don't just just neglect the body in in times of of dying, that we, we care for it and cultivate it in the same ways that we do in living. This calls us to healthy living, exercise, eating well in our lives, in our best days, but it also calls for us to receive care for our bodies even in dying. Sixth, Jesus cries, it is finished. This is a proclamation that he has accomplished everything that God put him on earth to do. This is my favorite one, guys and girls, because this means that we are living out our calling to the fullest every day. So I want to invite you to reflect as you lay your head on the pillow at night, maybe before, because you might fall asleep as soon as your head hits the pillow, right? Are you living every day to the fullest? Are you accomplishing God's calling in your life every single day? Will you be able to say if the, the unexpected were to happen tomorrow and God was to call you home, would you be able to say with Jesus, it is finished. I've been faithful with everything God has given me to do in this life. I want to ask you, if not, what is it going to take for you to get there? What changes do you need to make? What relationships do you need to cultivate in order to live out God's calling in your life? Finally, Jesus' last words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. These words were 
a, a statement of deep and abiding trust in his father, his good, good father who loved him and who he knew was going to receive him immediately when he slipped from life to everlasting life. That's the kind of trust that we need to cultivate every day so we can face our death with courage, unafraid. Dear friends, dying well means living well. And, and again, spoiler alert, all of our lives will end in death. And it's easy to keep mortality at arm's length because we want to enjoy life and live the good life. But life isn't just about preserving our time here on this earth. It's about leaving a legacy behind in those relationships that God has given us. It means instilling in our children or our coworkers or even our parents, people who are older than us, a sense of God's love. It's living out our purpose every day. It's being in constant relationship with God. It's not neglecting the things and the people that God has given us. And so living well involves all of the things that we said. Prayer and daily scripture reading. Living life together in Christian community. Learning to be image bearers and light bearers in relationship with others who are doing the same. Without those relationships, you're going to live like the rest of the world lives. But we've got to cultivate the source of the hope that we have. To live well is to die well, and to die well is to live well. Don't neglect the relationships that God has given you. That is so important. And don't neglect the calling that God has given you. We need not fear death, because here's the church's side. Jesus has already won the victory. And as Paul says, death is swallowed up in life. And that's a word I want to leave you today. Life is not just eternal, but it's everlasting. It begins here and now when you place your faith in Christ, and it never ends into eternity. There's never a point that you are not with God. And that is the hope to cultivate here. I leave you with some other words from Paul that he said when dealing with whether he wanted to continue suffering in life or whether he wanted to die and be in the presence of the Lord. And he said this, To live is Christ, and to die is gain. So whether I'm at home in the body or am I away with the Lord, I make it my aim to please Him. May we, each and every moment of our life and in our death, make it our aim to please God. Because just like there's learning to be done now, our time of dying is a time of learning as well, not only for us, but for our loved ones and our, our friends and our neighbors. So let's make it our aim to please God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. God, we thank you for being our good, good Father and for loving us so much with an everlasting love that, that your love never ends. Neither night, life nor death nor angels nor demons nor present nor the future nor anything can separate us from your love. God, we thank you for Jesus who lived our life and who died in our place so that we may be raised to everlasting life. God, we pray that we would be good companions to those who are dying that we would be able to, to care for them even if they're rejecting that care, that we can be your very presence with them so that they can learn of your love before they meet you face to face. God, we also pray that we would be a people who live well, who live every day as if we're preparing to die, leaving nothing in this life undone. Help us to have the difficult conversations, to ask for forgiveness and to receive it, to offer forgiveness when we need to, to be your children, to not neglect the relationships that you've given us. Help us to grow in our love of you and our love of others every day. God, we love you, we trust you, and we thank you that you call us your children. In Jesus' name.